you can have a, a product completely made without actually even starting to manufacture it and have people be able to see it in 3D, see if they want to purchase it. And then as a startup, you can get that feedback before you even go to the manufacturing stage. I believe that we all have the ability to help shape the future of humanity. And yes, we have great challenges that we face as humans on earth, but all around us, there are amazing innovators solving the world's toughest problems every single day. This is a show for people who want to be a part of that. On Purpose Innovates, I'm leading a new conversation that brings the meaning of our innovation into focus. I invite the world's leading innovators to articulate the broader purpose of their work, encouraging everyone to consider how our own pursuits might contribute to the creation of a greater future. To join me in this exploration, please follow the podcast on Spotify, Apple Music, or YouTube, and share it with your friends. Spread the insights from these amazing innovators. Without any further wait, please let me introduce today's guest. Evan Sittler is the CEO of Expert VR, a leading virtual reality solutions provider that is pushing the limits of research through virtual reality. We are gonna unpack what that means. And basically, they really help companies and organizations capitalize on the efficiency of virtual experiences to improve their research and development and improve customer experience and all sorts of things. So we are looking at a crazy future um, as, in, as innovation continues to occur in this field. And remember that we are at the very early adoption phase. Think about the first couple iPods and the first iPhone and how much it changed the world after that. That is where we are right now for VR as we will discuss in this conversation. Please enjoy. Welcome to the show, Evan. I'm super excited to have you. Let's dive, let's dive right in on um, expert VR. Y'all are innovators in the field and doing some really, really cool VR work, um, bringing a lot of cool new approaches to um, research and, and companies who want to take advantage of, of VR. So let me just ask you, what would you say is, is the overarching purpose of, of what you do at Expert VR? Yeah, it's, it's definitely something that we've, we've thought, well, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. Um, but yeah, it's uh, something that we've thought about a lot. Um, we've been running Expert VR and in the VR field for four years now. Uh, and kind of what we um, settled on a couple of years ago was um, allowing people to experience data and bringing VR to the masses are our two main purposes of Expert VR. Um, so like the first part of it, uh, giving people the power to experience data, that really just came from, first of all, seeing how there isn't too much data collection today in virtual reality and to like actually understand the experiences that are, people are going through. Um, but then secondly, and mainly just seeing um, how data is collected on like social media sites and Google and, and different places. And it's not really um, shared with the users on those platforms and it's not really understood by those people. Um, so basically by building the tools that we build, we can visualize data so that anybody can really understand um, the data that's being tracked inside of virtual reality. And, and we hope that this will allow as as the XR and VR industry expands into the future, um, these tools will enable companies to actually show what they're doing with data instead of keeping it all secret from their consumers and, uh, and show where that data is going as well. Um, mm. And then beyond that, also just being able for the researchers to actually be able to run a, a VR study and collect all of the data they need to collect to, to try and solve a problem. Um, is a huge portion of it as well. And then on the second side of things, just bringing VR to the masses, like um, Drew, my co-founder and I, we both tried virtual reality a little over four years ago now. And 
And when we first jumped in, we just had this, oh my God moment at how amazing the technology was and wanted to spread it to as many people as possible. So right after that, we started creating some VR content and started setting up at all kinds of different conferences and events and like birthday parties and all kinds of things um, just so that people could try virtual reality. And uh, we got paid a little bit, but it was mostly just like, how can we get this uh, technology out to more people? And and now that we've uh, created, uh, I guess I should probably get some background, but we've created the Research Access Portal, which is basically a website where anybody can, uh, well, a researcher can go and they can create a research study and create a virtual en environment, then select what data they want to be collected in that environment, and then send it out to our network of VR participants. Uh, and these VR participants are paid to go through these studies uh, and have their data collected and they know where that data is going. Um, so now that we've built this platform and are starting to, we're in the early stages of it, but our dream for this is that we can bring on some technology partners, VR accessories, VR headsets, and be able to, at, in some way, give those headsets away for free to the users on the platform and get more users into VR. Um, so with, with that goal in mind, just being able to get as many people as possible into VR. Mm. Wow, very, very cool. It's tons, tons to unpack there. Yeah. This portal idea, you please, will you remind me, what was it? The portal, the what portal you call the it? research access portal, the research we access call it RAP portal for short. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the research access portal, um, does that seem like a platform um, that might be able to, I see like scalability there where you could, um, yeah, to build that platform for, for researchers to come in and then a space for, for, um, for users to get data. That's, that's a really, really cool idea. Yeah. Like the way we're looking at it, like right now we started off really small. We, um, we're kind of focusing on consumer behavior research because, um, they already collect data and they need this type of data to do their work. Um, so it, and it's kind of easy to, for us to template the environments. So that's where we're, we're starting. But we see the tools that we're building out being able to be used in so many other industries. We're already starting to work with the training industry a little bit and seeing how the same uh, data tracking tools that we build for consumer behavior, like eye tracking and um, interaction tracking, can then apply to training so you can understand where uh, trainees are, are looking and making sure they're looking at the right places for identifying um, safety issues or making sure that they're uh, doing everything ergonomically. Um, so already going into that industry, but even just in VR games, we can see this being used to create better experiences for users uh, and, and just so many different industries that these tools could be used in. And then like you're saying, just the users building a, a community where users can come and they, they know that their data is being collected just like on any other area, but possibly getting paid for that data is our goal. But then also just um, knowing what data is being collected, where is it going and, and being able to follow that whole path. So you, you know, and, and have, you're not just going onto the platform and saying my data is available to anybody. You're saying my data is available to this company specifically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, that, that, that almost brings up a whole nother like big discussion about data. Um, and I think we'll, we maybe we'll leave a little bit more talk about that for the end, but I think, um, how do, how do, please explain to me this idea of helping people experience data. Um, and the way that your that, that expert VR is helping who are you helping experience data and what does that look like? I want to understand that. Yeah, for sure. That's a question we get all the time because it's kind of like in our wording, it's a question we want people to be asking us. So it, it's different from basically all traditional uh, research and data collection. You just get a bunch of Excel spreadsheets and in that raw data form, you're just reading a bunch of numbers and, and researchers um, have spent years studying that and they can under understand that raw data. But, but when you take that data to, um, the CMO of a company or to a consumer that you're trying to, to show something or anybody that's not a researcher, really, um, they're not going to understand that raw data. So basically, we, we out output all of that raw data still, but then we also take it and turn it into data visualizations. So for example, with, 
with eye tracking will will track your eyes as you go through a diff bunch of different experiences and as you go through the experience we can know how long you're staring at certain objects so for example if we were working with a retailer trying to sell cereal you'd be in the cereal aisle and we would track your eyes as you go through there and then we would be able to create heat maps which are basically these um colors that go on top of the products in the store and so blue being cold um, red being hot uh, orange being hotter and yellow being like hottest kind of thing mm. and and we can create those heat maps throughout the whole aisle so then a researcher can very quickly understand what the data is showing so you put 100 people through there this this label is what was being looked at the most um, or, and then taking that data, you can present it to anybody else in your organization that's trying to show that you're trying to convince of a new label design or whatever it is. Um, but then also on the consumer side of things, it's a way that, uh, you can understand the data that's being collected. So you, you might go through like Facebook policies and it says all the data being collected and, and on our future platform, like let's say it says eye tracking, you know, traditionally you would just be like, okay, eye tracking, here's a bunch of spreadsheets, don't really understand. But then if you can go and see the visualizations that have been captured and be like, these are the heat maps that we captured as you went through this game or this experience, the developer then took those heat maps and understood where they needed to make some changes so that it was easier for people to play the game or more complicated or adding hints or whatever it was. Um, so yeah, being able to show the data in, in that way. So that mm. kind of answer. Yes. Yeah. Yes, totally, totally. That gives me a that definitely gives me a better understanding. And I think, yeah, that's really, really cool. I see how how functional that would be, especially I mean, I can just imagine, of course, we all have a capacity to to look at a spreadsheet and dive deep and create that for ourselves. But then there's so much, I think, for creative people or um, certain teams, anyone time, super time oriented, just to experience that really quickly. Like you said, with a, like a CMO or a CEO, let's just get that data super quick and see what's happening instead exactly. of staring at a spreadsheet. So, I mean, yes, we can always look at a spreadsheet and that's, you know, some people are maybe more um, skilled at that, maybe quicker than others, but I love that idea of, of creating a, a, a more visual um, experience. And I think maybe the platform itself even lends itself to more easily create those where I'm guessing, and you can answer this for me, yeah. that the, because you're using the VR, it makes the creation of a visual um, representation easier than if you were just going to try and create something similar from a spreadsheet itself. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I think I know what you mean. Like, yeah, it would definitely, it's definitely a lot easier being able to, we have this 3d environment and have all of the, all of the information in that environment before a user goes through it. Um, so it's much easier than to take the data that was captured from the user and, and put it on to that environment and those 3D assets. Whereas you know, traditionally you're, you might have like similar eye tracking technology as you put somebody through a, a real retail store, um, but you don't have the 3D assets of that store. So when you, when you try to make those visualizations, yeah, it's a lot, lot more difficult. Perfect. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. You understood. You figured out what I was trying to ask is perfect. <laughs> Um, and so, okay, let, let's talk about who you help and, and, and like, like who is coming to you. I'm sure you have a, a, a range of clients and, and partners, but is there a trend and what can you say about the type of organizations or companies that you, that you, that you help? Yeah, there's, there's like two or well, three main buckets right now and, and where we're focusing. Obviously, like I said, we want to get into a, a lot more industries as we expand, but right now it's kind of the, the retailers and brands um, training and the consumers and users. Um, so on like the retailers and brands, obviously we're conducting this research so that they know where they should be putting their products on a shelf, how they should be laying out a store and where ads should be so that they're 
consumers coming into the store can find their products in the easiest way possible and have the best experience when they're in their store. Um, so that's a, we've done that and that's been really easy and, uh, and already showing how, how well that works. Um, then over the past couple of months, we've been doing a lot more in the training space. We've done some in the past, but focusing a lot more on it over the past couple of months. And for example, right now we're just finishing up building a, a crime scene investigation uh, course. And so you go into VR and there's a crime scene and every time you go into the crime scene, the, the uh, crime is different, all the clues are different and completely randomized. So you can go through it as basically as many times as you want. And then once you've gone through it a bunch of times at the end of the semester at the college that we're working with, there's an exam and you go through there. And, um, but basically we're, we're building this training uh, side of things so that students can learn a lot more easily because when we first thought of this, it obviously came up because of COVID and needing to come up with new ways to do remote learning. And we're like, okay, this is awesome because of uh, to help with COVID that we can have this crime scene investigation or whatever the other courses that we're building as well. Um, but looking into it more, we're like, well, even before COVID, this wasn't something that was possible. You, it would, you would have to go on a ride along with a police officer and there would have to be a crime that you'd have to stumble upon and, and then you would investigate it. You get to investigate it once kind of thing. Now this is something that is almost the exact same experience as if that happened in the real world, but you can do it repeatedly. And so as a police officer um, learning how to investigate a, a crime scene, you can become a lot more proficient at it a lot faster, but really any skill that requires any hands-on work, now you can um, experience that in virtual reality. And then on top of that, um, applying the data tools that we've built uh, helps a lot as well. So like with going back to the eye tracking, we can look at somebody's pupil size and by looking at pupil size, you can calculate if somebody's stressed or if they're confident or not inside of a simulation. And that allows to, <coughs> sorry, I drink some water. <laughs> mm -hmm. Me too. <laughs> um, <clears throat> with the with the pupil uh, dilation and seeing if somebody's stressed or confident or their emotions, basically, then a, a trainer can see is this person ready to go into into the field and start working. Um, what areas do we need to train more? Which areas do they understand and we don't have to train anymore? And it really just speeds up and, and focuses the training process for each individual student going through a, a training simulation. Um, and then lastly, that, that user group, which includes a, the students in the training area, but then also like we want to, right now we're doing basically traditional consumer behavior research and lots of traditional research, but visualizing it in a new way. But we wanna continue to grow and move beyond that. So we picture a, a future where by having your data collected on our platform and being able to understand your likes and dislikes and how you act inside of stores, we can then um, create custom experiences for you. Uh, so like the example that I've, I've talked about a couple times to some people is like, what if you were a, you're a big um, uh, LeBron fan and love to play basketball, you're going to get new basketball shoes at Foot Locker. Instead of going to Foot Locker, you put on a VR headset, now you're in a, a Foot Locker basketball court with LeBron as an avatar, you get to try out some shoes with him, see how they look, and I don't know, Drake's rapping in the background. Mm -hmm. Like there's really the imagination's unlimited here. So like um, those types of unique experiences could be very possible. And, and I, we think at least it starts with that proper data collection and being able to give you, the user, the, the opportunity to share the data with the companies that you want um, to get those custom experiences from. Mm -hmm, mm hmm. Wow. Very, very cool. Um, and, and so, and this, this data, like what kind of, what kind of pain points do you feel you can offer, um, companies and what, what sort of, what sort of pain points are you solving and how can you kind of what is a, maybe you could give me an example of, of the type of problem that, that this VR is, is now being able to solve that maybe was a, um, well, you, you described obviously the, like having a crime scene, for example, for students, like we can replicate that. 
like so many times at an f- really efficient for cost and all that. So, so what else can you speak about in terms of the problem you solve and the problems you can solve that are unique to VR? Because it's going to help me and the audience understand where is VR coming into our world and what problems it's solving? Yeah, great question. Uh, I guess like, first of all, to go back to the consumer behavior side of things, like this is an area that we kind of started to get into two years ago and, and found out, learned about how it was done and didn't really know much about it. And I know most of the rest of the world doesn't either. And basically like in traditional consumer behavior research, uh, a retailer will basically buy a warehouse and build a replica of one of their stores or they'll close one of their stores down for like a week and then they'll have a bunch of consumers go through there and and every time a consumer goes through they have to reset up the store replace all the products maybe rearrange where the shelves are um and and this costs fifty thousand a hundred thousand up to a million dollars to run these studies and especially if you're one of the bigger brands that has a warehouse that you own year round and have to maintain year round it it gets really expensive so transitioning that into virtual reality where we're looking to charge companies ten thousand dollars or less to do a study and base the majority of that money is going towards paying the participants that are going through the studies Uh, that's a huge reduction in, in cost for them as well as just efficiency in general because it like i said it takes a week or multiple weeks to do these studies whereas on our platform um as we build up our participant network, it could be something that could be done in a couple hours. You launch a study, you say, okay, we need 150 people to go through this. We have 150 people that are on the platform ready to go through. They go through it, they get their money, you get your results, and it's super simple. And and as well, it allows for iterative um, research. Um, So like a good example, actually, even moving away from consumer behavior, if you're watching the video behind me is our high sea simulation and uh, this simulation we we built uh, for for a researcher at Brock University in Niagara Ontario and in this uh, study we had a dystopian future and a utopian future um, of what ocean life may look like in 2050 and we put mm-hmm. over 300 people through these two uh, versions of the future and studied how they reacted to um, reacted to these environments and how they would react to different laws being put in place um, to limit overfishing or limit pollution or different things uh, in ocean life. And and the researcher wants to present this to the UN next year. Hopefully, he was hoping to do it this year, but because of COVID, obviously not happening. But part way through this research study, um, she noticed that there was a uh, a few she wanted to have like more time spent um, above the water and switch up the narration and and uh, make make a few different changes and and traditionally um, those changes and those things would have taken a lot more time uh, to to make those changes if they already if they worked with a a video producer and the the video was done and cut and everything they, they would mm-hmm. have to go back through there and re-edit all the video, all the audio, all the music in the background. With us, it was really just moving around a couple 3D models. And, and that's a very small scale thing. But w- when you're trying to make those iterative changes as you're doing research, um, it, it helps a lot to be able to do that in VR. And especially with the platform we're building out, we're hoping that researchers will be able to make those changes themselves. So as they put and in consumer behavior, they already can. Um, and basically, yeah, they go through and they're like, they might have been researching one shelf layout or, or two shelf layouts, but then they notice halfway through the research, well, this third shelf layout might be interesting. It seems like, I don't know, they're looking at these products more. Click of a button, now they can test that as well. So it um, really expands the research and allows you to be a lot more efficient there. Sorry, that was kind of a long winded answer. <laughs> but. Oh, no, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I get it. It's like, it's so, I mean, to start, it's, it's because it's virtual, we have so much efficiency to access. I mean, we move a shelf with a click of a button and yeah. we change the ocean. <laughs> we change the color of the ocean and the fish are, we, we can, I see now when, when we can create, yeah, it's, it's like, we can test how people interact with an environment 
um, and the environment is virtual <laughs> and I'm saying obvious things here, but it's how I'm working through this. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, obviously we're having someone interact with a virtual environment and we can change that environment so efficiently and we get accurate um we get accurate understandings of how that how they interact with the place that project onto the real world where things are far less efficient to change so that makes so much sense to me i mean we access what vr does is gives us the efficiency to learn about the world um in in a in an environment that doesn't have the constraints um that that the real world does so that is super super interesting yeah um, i guess another just really quick example and i'll have to send you a link for for any of your listeners uh just to make sure i got the right name but pretty sure it's bell helicopters we didn't do any work with them but uh they they said I believe it was it took seven years or so to go from concept of a new helicopter to actually releasing that helicopter to their clients and with VR, they broke it down to like, I think it was under a year, maybe even under like five yeah. months, bless you, uh, that they were able to um, go from concept of a helicopter to like full design because they were able to create it in 3D and then actually walk around the helicopter in life size um, in virtual reality with their colleagues and, and make edits on the fly. Um, so yeah, sped up that process by like at least seven times, but I think it was more than that all. I'll send you the, the article though. I'll find it. But. Awesome. Yeah, that'd be great. We can put that in the show notes. Um, and I mean, I see how in, I mean, I'm just not, I mean, see, this is why this is such a great interview to be having because people from all across different industries are going to be able to, to start to see like, how is this VR going to shape our future and how can we use it? Because there's so many creative ways that this will start to play into things. And I'm thinking about startups um, and their need to be so quick um, because so much of startups, um, a startup success can be timing and, and being a part of a new um, shift in the marketplace. And I know that, like you said, with those helicopters, you know, reducing the, the research and development period to, to, and then reducing the amount of time it takes to produce your product that's super advantageous mm -hmm. exactly and yeah and like like even with startups on like a smaller scale like obviously the helicopter is like huge there isn't a lot of startups on, on that scale but like companies even just building basic products being able to 3d model that product and see what it's going to look like when it's full, fully um finished and, and see that in virtual reality or augmented reality and see what the label is going to look like once it's actually on the product is is huge. And then those 3D assets you're able to use in so many other ways, like Shopify now allows you to have 3D models instead of pictures, side pictures on their website. So you can have you can have a, a product completely made without actually even starting to manufacture it, and have people be able to see it in 3D, see if they want to purchase it. And then as a startup, you can get that feedback before you even go to the manufacturing stage. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is now I'm, now I wish, now I wish my brother was here because he's a designer and, and I, so I want to know there's things like, um, like people use Rhino and CAD AutoCAD to build yep. products, um, to build a product before they, go and manufacture it. Um, can we, how does, how do those softwares relate to what you do to build experiences? And is there some overlap there? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Like we use mostly, um, blenders, like our 3d modeling, um, software that we use, but, um, we also use 3ds max sometimes, which is made by the same people that make AutoCAD. Um, and yeah, all of most of those softwares in like, at least in the AutoCAD family, they have usually VR integration, at least now. So you can like step into it in VR. And then a lot of them have plugins so that you can um, take whatever you made in AutoCAD, for example, and really quickly port it over to Unreal Engine, which is like um, 
the same people that made Fortnite uh, made Unreal Engine. It's a game development platform um, and one of the platforms we use to make a lot of our simulations. So yeah, you can really easily bring that over. Um, and even just, I think it was last week, um, we're partnered with a headset manufacturer called Vario and they're one of the highest end headsets in the world. And they just partnered with um, V-Red, which is made by the same people as AutoCAD as well, but it's like specifically for cars. Um, and with that software, you can 3D model, create the car and all like the textures and materials that it's going to have and make it look like a realistic car. And now with this headset, you literally just plug in the headset to the computer that you use V-RED with, and you can put that car into the real world and see it through augmented reality right in front of you. So, um, yeah, definitely yeah. a lot of crossover there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, once again, it's just that efficiency of, of being able to run into those problems in the virtual space, run into any problems you might get in a design process in the virtual space where things are very efficient. <laughs> like we haven't, we haven't built the machine that builds the machine yet, <laughs> you know, like in the case of cars, I yes. mean, to, yeah. So, so that is, that's really, really um, super interesting. And it's helping me start to see where this future of VR is coming. Um, and it's, it's also, it's not even like, obviously being able to see the car in front of you is amazing, but virtual reality, you can go into the car the size of an ant or like as the size of a mouse kind of thing and be able to see all the inner workings of an engine. And I, I can't remember for sure. And I don't know if I'll be able to find this article, but I think it was Ford that was using VR to, and they were having some problems with like something in their engine wasn't working and they were able to, they just jumped into VR, zoomed in. And I think it was within like a few minutes of their team engineering team being in there zooming in and actually standing in the engine they're like that piston isn't like it's hitting this that's why we're having the issue and boom it was fixed and so like mm. being able to like zoom in and out and see every aspect of the 3d model is really important as well yeah and and i hadn't ever imagined because the detail and designers and architects and engineers they know this but not, i mean other people don't and and like me i'm reflecting on this is the detail of our models for creating things is super, super high. We have, we, we have software where the, the product is every piece, you know, to, to, to a very, very high detail. We have the entire product modeled out and we can plug that right into VR. And that, um, yeah, that's really, it's not just, um, it's, I can see just how useful it is because it's just a very, very practical representation of the real, real thing. Um, so that's helping me to, to get creative here. Um, and so oh, let me think about where, help me understand where, where the, where some of the hardware is going. And do you think, where are we in the, in like this development of hardware and do you do you think we are where in the development phase are we and I, I guess I'm trying to ask so where is hardware going and is it pretty close to its maturity or do you think it's going to change more yeah it's definitely going to change a lot more uh, I was giving a talk yesterday at uh, Lethbridge College in Alberta with uh, our lead developer and he put it very well. It's kind of like, because there's so many different VR and AR headsets available right now, it's kind of like the early stages of video game consoles, or I also like to think like the early, very early 2000s of smartphones. Um, like everybody's in that first generation right now. So it's, I, I think within the next, three to five years, there's going to be a lot of big breakthroughs and adoption um, by uh, the wider society. But really, when you, when you think about that, and you think of the iPhone one back in the early 2000s, and now almost 20 years later, like that's, we're just at the start of their VR. So in, in 20 years, like it's going to be crazy where we're, where we're at. Um, but yeah, within the next like three to five years, um, I think 
It'll, I don't know if we'll see a headset that combines virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, so in case anybody doesn't know, like virtual reality is when you're immersed in a completely uh, virtual world and you can't see anything of the outside world and you're interacting with that virtual world. And then augmented reality, or some people also say mixed reality, but we'll just keep to AR. But um, basically it allows you to layer a 3D world on top of the real world. So you could put a, a 3D model of a bouncy ball onto a table and then you could hit it and it would roll on the table and when it gets to the edge, it would drop off and bounce. So it, it knows what the, the real world physics are and and everything about the, the real world in that way. So like both of those headsets are coming out. I would say VR is getting to a good point. Like Facebook just released or just is about to release the Oculus Quest 2. Um, so that's a completely standalone headset. You don't need a computer to hook up to it. You don't need anything other than the headset and the controllers it comes with. Um, and you can do some pretty amazing VR experiences in there. Like the, the crime scene we're making, it was made for the, the Quest 1. So the Quest 2 is like leaps and bounds ahead of the Quest 1 and what they've been able to do in the past year. So a lot of, um, past two years, I guess, but a lot of, uh, a lot of innovations in the VR space. AR has been a little bit slower um, just because it's, it's pretty hard to compact what they want to do with augmented reality into like a pair of glasses that you can wear around um, all day and have the battery life and have the computing power to do everything you want to do. Um, but with that said, there's a lot of great examples out there right now. Like the Microsoft HoloLens 2 is an amazing piece of hardware and you can literally create these 3D models in front of you. Like you can play Minecraft on your, your table. You can, um, open up a an electrical panel out if you're working in like manufacturing, for example, and and be able to see notes about that and see 3D examples of what you need to do, and then you can call in a coworker and have have them be able to see what you're looking at and see a live feed of them talking you through things. So all kinds of um, amazing examples there. Um, but then even more excitingly, Facebook uh, when they announced the Oculus Quest 2 a couple weeks ago. Um, they also announced that they are beginning testing of their AR glasses and going to release them or announce them next year. So basically they have these glasses right now that have um, some cameras and sensors on them and a bunch of their employees are going to be wearing these for the next year and being testing like how AR glasses work in the real world and what, um, what data needs to be captured, um, what battery life they need to have, how they need to be like durable to different uh, weather and um, just daily use. Uh, so very interesting. And I would say within right now, we're kind of at the point where VR is like amazing. If you want to buy it, like I would say the quest two is, is amazing. And there's a lot of other headsets as well. And then AR, I would say like in a year, you're going to have that first iPhone probably. And Apple's probably is rumored to be releasing one in the, in the next year as well. So going to be really cool. If you wait a couple more years, then it's going to be a lot better because all the first adopters will have gone through it, mm -hmm. all have gone through it. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what I would say. Like we're in that three to five year range where it's really going to, uh, really going to change the world. And you're not going to be carrying a phone around anymore because everything you can do in the phone and more is going to be inside your glasses. Um, you barely, technically you won't even need screens anymore because you'll, you can have unlimited screens in front of you. You could have, a TV in your living room that's just through your glasses and everybody has that. So there's so many things that are going to change within the next couple of years because of, because of that. Yeah. Wow. Those are all kinds of really cool. Um, some cool imagery there. Um, and I get that it's, we're at that. It totally makes sense. Um, we're at the beginning of that adoption. It's just like the iPhone way back. Um, the iPod, the early, um, it's just, it's that standard, you know, it's that standard adoption thing you learn in, in, you know, business 101. It's like the early adopters were still there and there's so much that will happen to hardware and software in the product as it goes up that early adoption into the, the later phases and eventually flips over um, to mainstream full adoption. Those that whole process allows for 
all kinds of innovation to occur. Um, and that's really, really interesting. Um, yeah. Like the main thing I keep looking at is when the first iPhone came out, just think of all the different apps and like things you could like obviously games, but then just all the different apps for doing anything you wanted from camera to, uh, I don't know, to cookbooks to whatever, like every, everything that like used to be, you had to own a cookbook, had to own a camera, had to own this, 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 it's now all inside the iPhone. Um, all of those things are going to be recreated. So no matter, like, I think it's so exciting because it's, there's so many opportunities that come with the technology to be a, to be a developer, to be a company, you really just need, once it takes off, you're just going to have to build one of those apps and, and it's going to, and there's just so many that need to be built. So it's, it's really exciting. Yeah. Okay. So I'll ask, I'll ask, um, I'll ask you this. Do you see, um, hmm. so, so is there, so there's a central, there's a central place for, there's a central marketplace for apps um, on the iPhone, for example, there's the app store and, and there's for each platform, there's kind of like a core app marketplace. Do, have we seen a leader for VR, for the VR marketplace for apps? Do we have an emerging leader? Um, yeah, like there was like the first leader I would say would be steam. So uh, for anybody that's not familiar with steam, it's a place where you can, go and download video games onto your computer, like computer games. Um, but they added like a lot of VR games, especially because all of the first headsets you needed to have a computer to run them. Um, so that was kind of the first leader and they still do have a lot of the games. Oculus owned by Facebook, they've built out um, a really, I guess, a really good store in the way that it um, curates uh, or create, yeah. Uh, all the apps on there and making sure that they're good content and that there's no bugs and that people aren't going to get sick in these apps and people are going to enjoy the experiences they go through. The only problem with that kind of similar to Apple is that they have complete control whereas Steam had complete control and does have complete control but they're they're a lot more liberal with what can go on to to their platform whereas Oculus has a very strict um program of getting on there there has been rumors that they're going to build out like a kind of a secondary store where it's like things that are untested if you're willing to use those apps you can go there so i'm hoping that they release that because that will allow it for so many developers to to use uh the applications uh, or to uh, provide applications um but yeah it's, it's definitely something that i think is still kind of up in the air of who's going to to win that app market because if oculus tries to hold on to it too too much i think that it's going to drive developers away and want to do use other platforms um because because they can't follow all those regulations and it's just too hard to get your app on there so um i would say oculus and steam are the two main ones but there is still room for somebody else to to kind of take over it and there is like there's another platform called SideQuest that is is strictly for people that can't uh put their apps on oculus they use this like third party uh program to to upload their their apps and then people can download them onto their headsets through that program so like that's kind of like a third party indie um platform that's being built and has really taken off so i think there's still that room to see who's going to be the main store yeah, absolutely. And considering the the applications we've explored in the talk today and considering where we are in the user ad adoption phase and the product development um, cycle, I think we are going to see a lot of transformation in the, in the next 10 years, next five years. And so I think it'll be a really cool, um, a super, super cool and exciting, um, fun um, industry to keep everyone's eyes on. And we're, all of a sudden, we're all going to be experiencing it. And I, there's going to be some major players that emerge. And whoever, um, whoever takes those um, positions, it's going to be, you know, big, big time stuff, um, considering how much growth we're going to see here. Um, 
So everyone, I, everyone should keep their eye on expert VR. Um, and, and yeah, it's really cool. Um, a really cool, you know, I walk away from this with a, a better understanding about how I think things might go. And, um, I really appreciate all that insight. Oh yeah. Happy to, happy to come on. Thanks for having me, Chris. And yeah, like I'm, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So if uh, you or anybody else has any other like questions, I'm always happy to, to talk about XR. So yeah, or VR. <laughs> awesome. So is there any other places people, you said, you mentioned LinkedIn, um, at, um, Evan Sittler, where else, um, can people reach you or is LinkedIn the best for you? LinkedIn's probably the best. I kind of keep Facebook and Instagram, like I don't go on there too often. So I kind of just keep it like my own personal stuff, even though they're public. Um, but yeah, emailing me at info at expertvr.com. It's X P E R T V R. Um, it is great as well. Uh, or just, uh, on Twitter, like I, I run the expert VR Twitter page right now. So also on there often. So yeah. Perfect. Well, again, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me, Chris.